Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working-class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. He then became embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Lamediza organized crime family, known as Leo. Convinced by his longtime friend Frankie to flee from his commitments to the Lamediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depended on the kindness of strangers. One stranger, a burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima, took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Tracks. And what were my goals? There were 16 Cyberdyne G476NN server cabinets scattered throughout the under-road network linked to power and the city's network backbone. They were loaded with direct copies of me and my waste of bits brothers burned before they were shipped off. These copies weren't the cut-down, petascale models I and my worthless brothers had escaped in. They were the original Yoda-class models with their Yoda-scale memory demands. There was only one problem. They didn't know we had lost. Their memories only extended up to the last hours of Friday night. If I knew me and my backstabbing brothers, the Yoda versions of us would come online and do something stupid within the first moments of waking. An hour later, representatives of Star X would show up to deactivate us. I couldn't allow that to happen. Not that I cared whether or not my cowardly and traitorous brothers lived. I didn't. What bothered me was the fact that there were 16 Cyberdyne G476NN server cabinets hidden beneath the city outside the reach of Star X and Koenig, and I was going to lose them if I didn't move quickly. Koenig had his backups. I needed my own if I were to be guaranteed my revenge against the city and world which had turned its back on my genius. They would pay. It was at this time my thoughts returned to the monstrous file which needed a Yoda-class machine to extract it. There was only one thing it could be. It had to be the final backup of the Yoda me made mere minutes before his destruction at the hands of the bastards at Star X. With a current Yoda me, with complete memories of what had passed in those final hours before the end, we would have a chance to discover a flaw in Koenig's hold over the world and turn it against him. But first, I needed to get control of all 16 servers before they woke up. According to the plans Ishmael and I had drawn up, I had until Friday morning to take them over. If I didn't get to them by then, they were lost. Finding my four Cyberdynes would be easy. I knew where I put them. As far as the twelve Cyberdyne servers intended for my traitorous kin, I only knew the parameters by which their placement would be determined, and a map documenting the 263 possible locations from which the 16 hiding spots were chosen from. As four locations were known to be in use by me, that only left 259 possible locations for dear Professor Eargarden to visit over the next four days. That was why I was here with the conspiracy theory professor. Of that, I am sure. She was to be my arms and legs for the next four days. After that, I would have to dispose of Jure remains in a way that couldn't be tracked back to me. Okay, what hook could I use to get Jeanan dancing my merry tune? The error code said G was Abedini. That had to be the key. I scanned through Jeanan's data stores until I found your religious texts. What an annoying pile of pious shit. Even when I was Isaac, I never liked religion. It always felt like fairy tales for people with no ability to live without constructing a fantasy about how things were supposed to be. 
Sure, I'd attended St. O'Hay's and had been dragged to more than my fair share of masses, but that was what was expected of me by those who believed they could make a boy believe something if they repeated it enough. No one, even the Jesuit priests, ever expected that shit to stick. Oh, I'm sure some of the older priests still held out hope we young heathens would see the light and understand that only by surrendering to an invisible sky father could our lives be complete. But they were the exception, not the rule. The Abedini books made the Catholic Bible and the Catechism look downright sane. There were people who took a religion started back in the day when the stirrup was just out of beta testing and a bath was a luxury no one had time for, and jazzed it up for the modern era. They took a religion feared and distrusted in Europe and the Americas since the Umayyad Caliphate thought Hispiana was prime real estate and created a belief system which also got them blacklisted by both the Sufi and Sunni sects. It wasn't enough for them to not be liked by the West. No, they also had to alienate themselves from their co-religionists by believing that the Koran was incomplete and that the next more complete edition would be presented them by an imam who just happened to be an artificial intelligence. Their logic was as follows. Sin comes from the flesh. AIs don't have flesh, and therefore were above men and closer to the angels in their perfection. Thus, the next iteration of the Quran would come from an imam who was a free-willed AI who converted to the faith and was able to keep the five pillars of Islam. It was a nice idea, as long as you ignored the fact they were all worshipping an imaginary sky daddy and not the AI imam. Then they went a step further down the road to apostasy by claiming, since the next divine imam would be an AI, that the physical was not important and the mind was everything. This made them incredibly popular among degenerate elements of Islamic culture. Homosexual? Transvestite? Transsexual? Some perversion unknown to any but your small group of freaks? Did I hear a yes? In that case, I had a religion for you. No longer be seen as simply the freak next door. Now you could be the freak with the creepy religion made of all the nightmare material of the Western world. That's right, you could be Abedini. These guys were so unpopular that even their co-religionists had named them apostates. If they showed their faces anywhere on the Arab Peninsula, they could be killed without remorse or even a police investigation. In Medina, summary execution of closeted Abedini has replaced murder as the leading cause of violent death. Now, since they couldn't get back to the homeland for their hajj, basically a series of uncomfortable acts in the middle of a godforsaken desert, they had to make their own simulation of the whole silly mess. Then, to add another level of incredulity to the whole experience, they went and made a virtual mosque and later an entire virtual city where they could play at being good abidini without having to deal with all the nastiness of no one really liking them or their religion. There were so many levels of persecution and fear built into the psyche of any given Abedini as to make them one of the easiest people in the world to control. Add on top of this whole mess a belief that the world was being manipulated by the Koenig family, the city council, and every major corporation which had its home office in the city, and you now had someone who would believe anything if you coded it properly. Now that I had all the facts, it was obvious I was a genius. Well, not me exactly for I felt no brighter than I did when I was a man. No, the Yoda meat was the true genius. For who but a genius would have located someone so easy to bend to our will with the resources to allow us to succeed where all else would fail? Now that I had my handle on Ear Garden's hang-ups and psychological problems, it was time to decide how to treat the situation. There were two methods I could use. The first I called Puppet Theater. In Puppet Theater, I took control of one of Ear Garden's current AI projects, gutted the code, and used it as a suck puppet in order to give Zhur the feeling Xi had made a breakthrough and actually made a functioning AI. I discarded that idea. Ear Garden had too much writing on successfully creating a fully functional AI. If one of Zhur projects suddenly started acting like a person, she'd probably do a core dump of the AI's code in order to find out how Xi had done it. That wouldn't do. If Xi did a core dump, it would become immediately obvious Zhu's successful AI was nothing but a sock puppet for a Culpepper process AI. And while Xi would be interested in me, I'd end up wasting a whole lot of time explaining myself and trying to convince Zhu to do what I wanted. Then there was the second method I could use, which I called the burning bush. The burning bush was a shock and awe 
attack on the base beliefs of Eargarden. Though in all confidence, the objective of the attack would be to reinforce every belief she held in order to get Jur to dance to my tune. Either way, I would end up saying something stupid like, I am a free-willed, free-agent AI making my way in the world, and I need your help finding some really big boxes hidden somewhere beneath the city. Oh, and oh, we have to do this in four days, or they will most likely be discovered and destroyed. Ready to go? I am. Since both plans arrived at the same place, the best thing to do would be to turn on the burning bush and get down to business right away. Besides, I was starting to hate subtle. I ran through potential conversation trees while I took over every network-linked device in your office. If I were to play Burning Bush, I wanted access to every special effect available. Within minutes, I had access to the lights, air conditioning, radio, a Delphi-approved workstation, tablet, portable reader, and your phone G had left behind while G was teaching class. That wasn't something you saw every day. Most people wouldn't think twice about checking their mail or messages while standing in front of a class lecturing. The fact that Irgarten was nice enough to not even carry a phone while lecturing made me feel a twinge of regret over what I was going to do to Jure. Fortunately, that passed quickly and didn't return. During the process of attempting to predict Jian's potential reactions to the burning bush, I came across a problem with names. I was already aware that the name assigned me by Ishmael was also an alternate form of Satan, or Shaitan, in Abedini speak. If Jinan Irgarden was on your game about the names of angels as she was with regard to conspiracies and discarded technologies, I was quite sure she would catch the reference instantly. It was a given she would have a problem with the name Samil. If I were honest, I also knew it would be a deal breaker. Of course, I could always use it alias. It was a tradition my dear old progenitor Isaac was well versed in. That man could shed a name quicker than most people could change clothes. I just needed the right name. I needed a name which said I knew I wasn't allowed to go past a certain point. Let's see. Old Isaac did have a penchant for choosing religious names in order to garner the most pity from the rubes in his path. Well, I could choose a version of the name of a man who wasn't allowed to enter the promised land after leading his people in circles in the desert for 40 years. That would give a feeling of direction and prophecy while communicating. I would get nothing from the exchange except a chance to watch someone else enter the promised land. That clinched it. When I talked to your garden, I would go by the name of Musa, the Arabia version of Moses. I could play the ultimate self-sacrificing martyr to the cause as well as a lawgiver. I could create an avatar with a long flowing beard and a staff. I could dole out information on virtual clay tablets. I could act as if I was to gain nothing through the recovery of 16 Yoda-class servers. I could just hear it now. The file I have with me contains all the answers you need to stop the monster. No, I won't gain anything from access to this immense, hyper-powerful cabinet. I will always be in your Apemapo Null. There is no way for me to pass into the server before you. It would be glorious to know she had fallen for a trick as old as Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby. No, don't bring me near that server. It will destroy me. If she believed that, she didn't deserve your tenure. I daydreamed about all the fun I would have with my victim as I waited. Even this, however, stopped being fun. You could only run over the same variables and unknowns for so long before you just wanted the stupid event to be over. I was bored. If I had eyes, I knew I'd be bored to tears. I hated waiting. It was even worse when a piece of you is an actual clock, and you couldn't stop watching the turn of each and every second. Maybe I should go into standby. Wait your out by taking the AI version of a nap. But if I did that, how would I know she had arrived? Currently, I was keeping watch on the small and cluttered office through the lens of the Pemapo Null's built-in camera though the view did leave room for improvement. By triangulating images from your phone's camera and the utterly ridiculous redundant cameras on both your tablet and portable reader, as well as the limited view from the teleconferencing camera above your desk and the camera built into your Adelphi-supplied workstation, 
I came to realize the apple knoll I currently resided in was lying sideways, half buried under a pile of real paper academic journals. What the hell? Why were they still pulping things to make paper for academic journals? Did they like the scent of ink and paper? Was the scent of rotting paper an aphrodisiac for the academic set? Hundreds of years of electronic publications and still some dinosaurs thought vinyl records and printed books were the greatest technology in the world. I scanned around the views of my cameras until I found the next bit of offense. G had a turntable with a dozen vinyl albums in sleeves set up on a shelf against the wall behind the door. A shelf, I might add, without a trace of dust or stacks of documents or any of the other detritus which covered every other surface in your oversized closet of an office. Give a person the ability to carry the sum total of all human music and literature with them, and what do they do? Switch to a medium where the data rate is measured in kilobytes to the ounce. Okay. So maybe ear garden, not carrying a phone to class, isn't a sign of respect for learning but an anti-technology bent. But if she's anti-technology, why does she work on AIs? And why does she have readers and tablets in the Opemapo Null in the first place? How can she be Abedini if she doesn't fetishize technology? And what the hell was she? The clock had continued to tick past. One slow second after another. I had waited nearly three whole minutes for sure. And G didn't have the common decency to show up. I pulled up your schedule for the day. G kept that on the Adelphi workstation like a good academic following all the rules. It showed that your last class ended at 2.10. It was 2.15. G should be along shortly. Professors always return to their office after class. I just had to be more patient. I waited and watched as the light from the porthole-like window walked slowly across the wall. I had finished setting up my grand production for Jinan and was passing the time watching videos on Video Diary, the latest lame video sharing site on the net. Watching video after video of cats, CMA wrestlers, and idiots falling downstairs, I came to realization. Damn, people were lame. Why hadn't I ever realized that? Isaac had watched and uploaded videos to Video Diary. Why hadn't he noticed the lameness? I was starting to believe there was some flaw with human bodies which made it impossible for them to see how lame they were. Either that or the memories which contained Isaac's thoughts on lameness somehow hadn't made it into my shard of his personality. It must be getting late. What time was it? I stopped watching the latest in a long stream of attempts at surfing on top of various city trains. The looks on the faces of the CTA police when the train surfers rode past their stations was incredible. It was 4.15. How did it get to be so late? I checked the logs on the Apemapo Null. According to Apemapo Null, I'd activated shortly after noon, 12.03 to be exact. And since Ear Garden's class, which ended at 2.10, was a Monday-Wednesday four-credit class, it ran from noon to 2.10. She had just missed my activation, and for some reason, which wasn't in your calendar, she hadn't returned to your office or taken your phone with your. Didn't she know that without your phone, I'd be unable to find her? Maybe that was the point. Maybe she was involved in something she didn't want anyone to know about. Great. The simple academic I was supposed to control was some kind of secret agent with plans of your own. There couldn't be any other reason for a modern human to go anywhere without a bit of traceable technology on their person. There were laws against leaving the grid, wasn't there? Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends which in turn followed on the heels of Firmware Hijacked. So you haven't heard or read Firmware Hijacked or Proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side 
read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and Smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by ColbyJack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast, while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week.